behalf of the organization, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to this third and final lecture in our series entitled Women Artists Overcoming Obstacles. I was trying to remember the earliest memories of Matrix and why we did it and what those dynamics were. And it finally kind of came back to me, a meeting at Georgiana Holden, otherwise known as Porgy, Porgy yes. Mills, um, in her house. And apparently there were a group of women who had gotten together before. I don't know if it was just once a year, but it was several times. And they were talking about um, what could they do to be more supportive of each other in, in the art community and making art and stuff. And uh, so that, that was kind of the earliest memory of it that I have. Eventually, the uh, homes got too small. I mean, there were so many people. Obviously, it met a need. So there were so many people coming in that we needed a space to, um, to meet. And uh, we heard about a studio that was uh, coming available in, Art, in Oak Park on Broadway. Uh, and we realized that if we each chipped in 10 bucks a month, we would um, be able to rent the place and have a place to show our work and, and meet and a center, sort of. Uh, so uh, I think there were about 15 of us that made that commitment, and um, we rented the space and we're off and running. Had a show the next month, I think. <laughs> the, the environment at the time was really different than it is now for women artists. Um, and I was thinking back and in graduate school for at least part of the time I was in grad school at Davis, uh, I was the only female in the graduate program. There was at the time only, I think there were two female teachers and one taught in home ec and the other one then left. So it was a very male dominated community. And um, it was also the environment of when women that I knew applied for jobs after grad school, like one friend who had her doctorate in philosophy and a master's in art history and was getting a master's in painting. Uh, in her interview, she was asked um, if she, what birth control she took, something that would be completely out of the question to ask these days. And another woman was told in an interview that um, they really liked her for a sculpture position, but they didn't want the man in the faculty uh, to have to do all the hard work, the heavy work, and she brilliantly just turned around and stood up and lifted up a big overstuffed chair and she got the job. Um, but anyway, those kinds of things were really common. I was told in an interview I didn't get the job because they wanted a family man. And these days, you couldn't do that. Uh, I don't want to really mention any names because I don't want to book you know, drag any men's names through the mud, but um, at Sac State, when I became pregnant with my son, um, and I was like in my junior year of college, and I was going to have to, um, I was going to have to miss like six months of school, right? So I went to the chair of the department, and I talked to him and said, you know, I still want to continue. And he pretty much said to me, if you're going to have children, don't bother coming back. My idea was that we would literally have a workshop, that we would share equipment, that I'd get my table saw and get it in there and would, you know, would have really a shop and would teach each other how to do things, skills that we hadn't learned along the way. Um, I think Maru Hober was really interested in that shop aspect. I cannot remember how I met Pam Johnson or Poor G. Ells. As a sculptor, I was thrilled because I hardly had any tools myself. Um, and then it progressed into a showing space uh, and people wanted to show. And that was the very, very, very beginning of, of Matrix. Um, I think we were all sort of nervous and uh, we were afraid to really be who we were, and at one point we actually hired a psychiatrist to help us. Um, and she passed around little pieces of paper and she said, everybody write down your worst fear about being in this group. And everybody anonymously wrote on a piece of paper the same thing. And it was basically, 
I am afraid that I and my work will be considered <laughs> worthless. <laughs> and I joined Patriots quite a bit later than that, in 1980. And I had been living in Boston, and I was a lawyer, but I had always been an artist. And we moved to California, and basically I knew nobody. My husband and I came. Um, and I met a woman who, in Davis, I was living in Davis, who was an artist. And either she or somebody else told me about Matrix. She may have told me, but she was not a member. And I decided I would join because I was coming across the country. I didn't know anybody. I could start basically a new life. I could be whomever I wanted to be. And I was not bound by who I was before. And so if I wanted to be an artist, I needed to meet other artists. And I needed to meet women artists, particularly because at that time, it was pretty clear that if you wanted to be taken seriously, men didn't take you seriously. No artists simply didn't take women seriously. And I don't know that I took myself seriously as an artist. So I joined Matrix, and I volunteered to be treasurer because I figured that was the way to meet people, and to be really be part of it, not because I wanted to do it. In fact, I hated doing it. But nevertheless, I did it. I have to go back to the story about um turning around three times. It was at a Matrix opening, and one of the Matrix members, Gypsy, had a girlfriend who was six feet tall. And she told me she was a witch. And I was fascinated. I said, and, you know, I, I felt very free to ask anybody anything then. I said, how do you know you're a witch? How did you know? And she said, I turned around three times and I said, I am a witch. And there were a whole bunch of artists standing around and they all said, that's how you become an artist. <laughs> and I think I was teaching at um, Sacramento City College at that time. And I noticed that students would take classes for years and years and years, but they would never say, I am an artist. They said, oh, I'm trying to be an artist or I'm studying. And it's such a female thing and at some point, we just have to say, this is who we are, and this is what we do. And I think that's really important. Right. And one of the things that uh, that I noticed that I felt was very difficult was because I was a lawyer. And one of the things about being a lawyer at that time was, you know, women lawyers were not liked very much, and the men did not like women interfering in an important masculine occupation or profession. But there were rules. You got a law, law degree, you went to law school, you got the degree, you passed the bar exam, you could go into court. There were rules about how you present yourself, how you present art, arguments, what you do, and you can win whether they like you or not. It makes no <laughs> difference at all. Whereas if you're an artist, and particularly at that time, because at that time, not everyone who wanted to be an artist got an MFA. It was unusual, or somewhat unusual, but many people didn't. So it was not clear how you qualified yourself to be an artist. You couldn't say, well, I have this paper that says I'm an artist, and now you can't question that. I can come and do what I please. So it was a much more difficult proposition to feel that you were an artist and to say it and to know that other people would actually believe it and take it seriously. When I first arrived in Sacramento, there was really only one great art gallery, and they only showed men. And um, it was very intimidating to not be taken seriously. She, uh, she has a poster in her studio that you'll have to look at from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it says, do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum of Art? And uh, it said that 5% of the Artists in the museum are women, but 80-some percent of the women who are in the art are, are naked, which, you know, they're in paintings or sculpture or something like that. There were more pe people who were interested in a gallery. I wasn't especially, um, though uh, one gallery that I showed with at the time, um, a kind of uh, last, uh, Oh, a kind of final straw kind of thing that really got me was there was a group show there had, and um, at the gallery 
at the Artist Contemporary Gallery, and all the and, and so there were men and women in the show. It was mixed, and but the women, if they had a husband in the show, they were listed second. So it was alphabetical except for the women, who were put into place secondarily to their husbands, which was not meant to underappreciate anyone. It was just simply it hadn't the, been thought of that, that was, would be that demeaning. was the time. Yeah. That's what you did in polite company, kind of. Um, and at the time, I thought, oh, there, there it is. There it is. So evident of how women are thought of in the art community as kind of, um, as Elaine de Kooning said, as kind of mascots or wives or, you know. Anyway, um, but I had places to exhibit my work, so I wasn't so interested in exhibiting work as I was in a supportive community of women working together. And I particularly wanted a community of women with tools, but <laughs> that aspect didn't work. That was about the point that you came and joined. Yeah, I just moved from Monterey to Auburn area. And so I went down to Sac State to talk to my former, one of my most favorite uh, teachers there in the art department, Bob Else, about the possibility of getting a teaching job. He wasn't sure about that, but if I wanted to get involved with um, finding more out, uh, maybe with other women, um, there was an ul ulterior motive for <laughs> seeking out a women's artist group, too. I think it was Marty Renault who told us about uh, Sierra, too. It, I, I live just a couple of blocks from it. And it was an old elementary school, wonderful old set of buildings. And people in the neighborhood I knew were trying to get it um, uh, saved from being torn down, flattened, and uh, condominiums I think were going to be put up. Or they also talked about some kind of a parking lot in there. I'm not quite sure what it, it was for. But anyway, people in the neighborhood, uh, particularly including Marty and Dennis Renault, uh, worked really hard with the with the the city schools with the city and all to get Sierra to uh, essentially saved and at the point that we came in on it um, they were looking to see who the tenants might be of the new space we moved from the Broadway space eventually to Sierra two when it was being um, saved from uh, demolition. <laughs> they were trying to tr uh, turn that old school building into a community center uh, in our neighborhood. My husband was very involved in that. We decided amongst neighbors who got together and discussed it that the school could be used as a community center. So in the community center there would be all these classrooms just as in the school except they would have different uses and uh, groups, nonprofit groups, could use these rooms for as long as they paid some kind of rent to help maintain the building. So um, when the neighbors got together and decided that the school would have a good purpose as a community center, uh, it had the number of people that would be able to accomplish things that a community center. And one of those groups, for example, was Matrix, which was the women artists who were organized and uh, who rented space in the very beginning. Beautiful high ceilings, natural light, two rooms, you know, we could have a classroom in one and a gallery in the other, little office, restroom, it was all just right. So we, we committed to do that, even though it required an awful lot of rehabilitation and construction <laughs> to make it into a gallery. But that was, to me, the, the real beginning of Matrix as an organization that, that was really uh, encouraging and empowering 
for the women involved. The physical kind of renovation of that space um, I think was a, a really significant stepping stone in us when I got a full-time job at Sierra and we bought this property and, and looked toward moving up here that to, to actually take hold and design a whole house, um, which we got really serious, wonderful help from a man named Brent Smith and how to uh, how to go about doing that but to ha actually have the the um, the kind of belief and energy that we could do it I think Matrix was really pivotal. I think one of the really big things was the beginning of the women's movement and uh, it was really great for a bunch of people with common goals to get together and take themselves seriously and when we did that, other people took us seriously, too. Um, I think Sacramento at that time was becoming a city that was interested in art. Uh, they had a great arts commission at that point in time. Most cities in California designated that 1% of the money for public buildings had to be uh, devoted to art, but Sacramento designated that 2% of the money had to go for art. That period of time, um, it was my impression that Matrix was one of the top galleries in Sacramento. And um, at that period of time, one of the most respected, uh, active, lively communities of artists um, um, in Sacramento right then. Sacramento, that you know, used to be the galleries would come and go, and they could survive for a certain amount of time, and then they would, you know, the, the, it didn't work out. People didn't make enough money at it. It's a very difficult kind of business, and um, and Matrix just was vibrant. It was really energetic. A lot of that the openings would be really crowded, and it wasn't. I saw that the, a clip of with all the wine bottles, and it's like it wasn't just the wine. <laughs> no, no, people didn't know what we would do next. I think the yeah. tradition is that you do the work kind of in your own private little hermetic studio, and uh, and then bring it to the gallery, ready, done, and put it up on the walls, finished. And so I thought it would be an interesting idea to um, do the work during the show in the gallery. It was uh, on something I'd never painted before. Um, the theme was horses, wild horses. Um, so there were several challenges involved, and I think that really generated energy uh, in the work. Enemy. I remember a thing where Pam Maddock uh, was working uh, in the in uh, the print uh, department in uh, Intaglio Printing at Davis, and and Price Emerson was running the, at that time the UC Davis Art Gallery. Certainly, well, my friendship with Pam was probably begun before Matrix, but certainly extended beyond Matrix. Even though over the years we haven't stayed in close contact. We've stayed close, but not in close contact. I remember painting, <laughs> and I remember a big controversy. We were getting ready to paint for an, ex an exhibition that this Sierra 2 was putting on for, for our gallery, and we were having a debate about whether the wall should be white or not white. And it was my idea that the wall should be this really subtle kind of gray lavender color, which is an idea that I got from Price Emerson at UC Davis, who was then the director of the Nelson Gallery. And it makes, and I, I tried to make the case that the off-white color makes the white of an artwork really pop and stand out. And I think I finally convinced everybody, because I'm pretty sure we ended up painting the walls that color. I've forgotten what it was called, so gray mist or something. But it had a lavender cast to it, and I thought it was particularly beautiful. And that, that was just one of the funny things that I remember about, you know, working in the Sierra 2 space. I do remember being there again for, 
figure drawing sessions? Uh, we were a nonprofit gallery, and that meant that, uh, I mean, we welcomed sales, but we weren't dependent on them. Uh, we got a lot of grants uh, from um, the government, uh, from the Arts Council, uh, that sort of thing. And um, so that meant that uh, members could uh, pretty much experiment. And that was very important to me. I uh, realized that my art was not going to fit into a commercial gallery uh, that required sales and so forth. Uh, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to have to paint for people to buy it. I wanted to paint for my own self-expression and what I felt was important. And so it was, it was a perfect venue for me, and I think a lot of others felt that way too. Uh, and it was very encouraging. I mean, you got uh, really um, important critiques of your work. You know, we'd have uh, sessions, everybody would bring a piece and, and the group would talk about it. And they weren't um, vicious or anything. I mean, it was other artists helping, you know, giving another perspective, and that was really valuable. And uh, you made friends. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't uh, go to school in Sacramento, and so I didn't know uh, other artists there. So that was really nice, too. And uh, one of our um, uh, things that we had that I also found very valuable was um, a figure studio uh, with nude models. And um, it was all, anybody could come, it wasn't just Matrix members. Uh, everybody would pitch in a certain amount and uh, pay the model, and the model would do poses however we wanted, you know. So I ran that for several years, and uh, it was really good. And it got me there every week, which was good. <laughs> Probably never would have. Um, gone to the trouble of photographing my work and, you know, doctoring up the slides and sending them away to competitions. But um, it was um, uh, one of the things that we all encourage each other to do was get our work shown. And if you get into a competitive show, that proves that somebody at least liked your work well enough to put it up on the wall. So you had to, in those days, you know, again, before digital cameras, you know, you took slides of your work. And uh, that was a pain in the butt, I tell you. But um, the uh, uh, peer pressure got me to do it. So I now have a catalog of old slides of, of work, that a lot of which I don't have anymore. And it's, um, I wouldn't have had that if, if it hadn't been for Matrix, believe me. We had actual workshops of people coming in to tell us how to do it and how to uh, get your work shown. So I had my very first one-person show at Matrix. And uh, it was very fun, and I was a little unsure about a couple of pieces. And one of my professors from Sac State came, and I said, I feel a little nervous about this. And he says, well, he said, different people like different things. He said, just put it out there. And, um, and he was right. I can't remember what I said about that painting. Um, it, it was um, accepted into the Crocker Kingsley Art Show, which is kind of a prestigious competition. Uh, in Sacramento, but uh, it taught me a good lesson, which I uh, shared with uh, other Matrix members, of course, and any other new artist who gets discouraged about not getting into competitions, because um, that particular painting I had submitted to a Matrix jury show, and it didn't get in, it was rejected, but then I submitted it to the Crocker Kingsley, and it was accepted, so my philosophy is, you know, it's one judge, you know, they have their, <laughs> their tastes and uh, some people, you know, will react in one way and some another, but it doesn't mean anything about the quality of your work. One way it affected me and I think other people is we made a lot of friends. We knew a lot of other artists. And so there was still a support group or a support network even after we left Matrix and weren't working there because we knew other people, we knew people who would help us professionally, who could help us find shows, who might arrange shows, might say, you know, why don't you join this, why don't you do that. Um, I know Dixie and I, for example, joined a gallery in Sacramento called the 750 Gallery, and partly it was because we knew each other. I mean, I think I had joined it and she joined it. Um, there were people you could call on and you could talk about your work or come and look at it. And, get some feedback. You weren't, we were no longer as isolated as we had been prior to joining Matrix.
first got involved in the Matrix, but I remember that I uh, uh, went to a meeting and I uh, met a lot of other women artists there, and uh, I uh, we had a um, we rented a place on Broadway, and uh, that's my first memories of um, Matrix. I just moved to Sacramento in the the seventy. Four, and um, I, I didn't know anybody here. Um, I had lived in another state at that time. I moved here from Iowa, and uh, I lived in, I'm from California, but I moved there with my husband, and then we moved to Sacramento, and uh, I never lived in Sacramento, and I only knew um, the, you know, I didn't know very many people, and uh, so I was looking to meet up with other people who were artists, and this was a chance that I had to, to meet people who had the same interests as I did. Meet other women who were uh, good artists, and um, some were older than me, and uh, one woman, uh, Georgiana Else, uh, she said that she was the grandmother of, of uh, our organization, and uh, she was kind of like a mentor to us because she had told about uh, how she work to become an artist at times when it was even more difficult to be an artist. So one of the things that was very good about Matrix is was that we had our own gallery and the, all, all the women got to have all the jobs and uh, we got to uh, you know choose the art and be in the shows and things like that but then uh, the husbands of the Matrix people uh, wanted to be included too but uh, so they had a kind of a, a uh, they got themselves some t-shirts and they put on it matrix auxiliary and that was so that they would be the helpers and they um, when we had a show they uh, would be the ones that would be serving refreshments on their t-shirts that said matrix auxiliary and uh, this is sort of uh, funny because most of the time people who are the auxiliary people are the women who are helping the men so they kind of enjoyed this uh, turn around and uh, so it, w it was really, I thought it was funny and, and kind of fun too. So that was nice to have uh, us there and I think it also helped me be a, uh, I went to graduate school around the t same time that I was in Matrix so I think those two things together work really good for me. I kind of got my feet wet with Matrix and I understood that I could uh, be a, an artist and I could have shows and stuff like that. Then I had a chance to have other shows, other places, and some of the people in Matrix helped me with the, you know, invited me to be in shows or told me that I should try to do this. And um, so a lot of times they helped me move on to the next steps. For instance, Barbara Millman, she said to me that she wanted me to uh, be a member of the California Society of Printmakers and, and she said it would be really fun for us to travel down to the Bay Area and go to their meetings every year and uh, so you know if she hadn't suggested that to me I probably would have uh, might, might not have done it. I, I had a lot of wonderful memories of Matrix but I, I felt really glad that I met a lot of other women artists at the time because I realized that there weren't a lot of opportunities for women to show their art in Sacramento, and um, I want to be part of something that made that happen for women. I enjoyed the community of Matrix, and it brought me into the idea that with Art Hotel and Art Street, I loved working with other artists working. We all worked alone, but there was always a helping hand from other people whenever you needed it. And uh, people were people in groups you don't I, the work itself is very isolating so when you're in your studio there's nobody around and it's wonderful when you have groups to share that work with because I think there's a lot of growth that comes out of that and being able to see what is really going on and how people are responding to the world right now you know in, in time and place and that's all an artist can do is show their experience of the world right now and it's, it's wonderful when you can do it with a group. I would, uh, we would have many different artists come in to show in our gallery which gave me an idea of how to present for, you know, to, for a gallery show 
and how what things would look good in a gallery. It made, it made a lot of difference, and I made some lifelong friends. I mean, I, to this day, I still have my friends like Julia. Uh, we were friends in school, we were friends in Matrix, and we just continued, you know, being friends. So, yeah, so it had everything. It had a little of everything. A lot of experience, uh, sometimes experiences that were tough, you know. <laughs> but, you know, running a gallery was a step that we took that changed the way things were because there was so much time spent trying to maintain a gallery. I started with Matrix um, in 87 or 86 when they were on 2nd Avenue still. And that was the first spot. And I joined Matrix to be part of a, a gallery organization. Matrix was full of women who were mothers. Mm -hmm. and wives and so they had to do they had other things that they had to do other responsibilities they had to take care of and it was understood that right. the women had uh, kids at home or might have to leave early or might have to drop something off have someone else pick it up or something yeah. like that they People, were... if they want to buy art they can buy art 24 hours a day but right. you can go see art and talk to other people about art on Second Saturday. Right. But that started it with Michael Himovitz and then uh, Matrix of 50, those, those galleries. And then also, I guess, I Street Gallery too. Oh yeah, I Street. So, yeah, Matrix had a heyday for feminist um, ideology and then it, it kind of, um, yeah, opened up a bit. To, to men too. I, I think the mission stayed the same for a little bit, but then it changed. It was more of a gallery for, for community. The courage isn't the absence of fear, it's having the fear and, and moving on and stepping forward and doing it, in, even though you have fear. No matter your skin color, gender, sexuality, religion, age, nationality, all comes into our lives without any rules and limitations. All transcends all human boundaries. Maybe you're a woman working in a male-dominant field. Maybe you're gay with a conservative family. Maybe you're an atheist living in a religious country. Maybe you're a 70-year-old college student. Or maybe you're an immigrant child. Whether you're like me, a foreigner studying in a foreign land, with all the fear and prejudice that come along with that, will whether you just feel like a foreigner? There are so many of us who feel like outsiders. The woman of metrics show us that instead of giving up, find a community or form a community. Because no matter how foreign you feel, you are not alone.